when you go to the grocery store and you're looking at apples and you see an apple that's bruised, you're gonna pass over that apple. The problem is everybody does that. And so what does that result in? Wasted food. No one likes the idea of wasting food. Everyone wants to be a part of this solution, but there are very few companies who are actually making a real impact. Divert is one of them. Co-founder and CEO Ryan Deegan is helping bring Divert's mission to life. Solve the food waste crisis by establishing a data-centric platform. And the big key, connecting the dots of the massive food industry puzzle. Deegan's prior career experience laid the early technical foundation for Divert. And now, 16 years later, they support more than 5,000 retail stores donate more than 9 million meals to those in need, and process more than 2 billion pounds of wasted food into renewable energy, all to protect the value of food. Put your hands together for Ryan Began. Thank you, what a great opportunity. Uh, as noted, I've been doing this for 16 years, digging through wasted food that really some of you guys have been providing and just an amazing opportunity. First, want to thank Matt and the OPS team for the opportunity for getting everybody together, the largest OPS in the history of the organization. So amazing. Um, so congratulations. A hand. Thank you. So I wanted to start, you know, just a little bit on my background. I graduated electrical engineering, has nothing to do with food waste, but really a passion for sustainability. Started my career in green hydrogen, uh, installed systems in 2001 in Ukraine and Germany, you know, really bringing green hydrogen to sources of direct need. From there, I went to Raytheon Missile Defense, which again, has absolutely nothing to do with wasted food. I was a square peg and a round hole, but a formative experience at a startup company uh, but then transitioning into missile defense where I really able to understand the virtues of engineering and problem solving. Uh, was applying to business schools, rejected from every single one of them, but had the opportunity to meet other folks that were interested in sustainability. And that's what got me into food waste. And where does that mean? It means that I'm in my dad's backyard with his pickup truck loaded with a thousand pounds of food waste from Hannaford Brothers. This is circa 2007 a more handsome Ryan, and my dad saying, what in the hell are you doing in my backyard with a thousand pounds of food waste? And we were learning. Uh, we were really learning about the problem. What is food waste? What is wasted food? And since 2007, I've been, I've been hooked. Uh, and so what is that problem? It's 63 million tons per year that we create in the U.S. that goes to landf excuse me, landfill. That is 35% of everything that is sent to landfill is wasted food. And so what does that represent? That is all of the nutrients, the water, the energy, the resources, the time, the care that goes into creating food sent through the entire supply chain only to make its way to the landfill. So it's a very large problem. And our initial approach was a behind the grocery store solution where we were going to have this distributed network of facilities to use anaerobic digestion, produce energy, and give it to retailers. And it was just an absolutely terrible idea. Again, um, anybody who maintains equipment, having thousands of these systems across the country, impossible to maintain. And that led us to our relationship with Kroger. So we had our first major commercial success in Compton, California, Ralph's and Food for Less, Kendra Doyle, uh, amazing partners. And what did Kroger do? They, they really took a risk understanding that we needed to do something about wasted food in the US, especially California, AB 1826 uh, in place. And they helped us. They, they really established the idea that we're going to build infrastructure. And then shortly behind that, we had Ajo Delhaes uh, join the fight and, and do the same thing in Massachusetts. So how does this all work? We start with a process called reverse logistics. We're using that closed loop supply chain that anything can, that cannot be sold or donated at grocery stores brought back to the distribution center. So immediately we're eliminating all of those trash trucks on the road. This is really bruised apples that nobody wants. It's not rotting. As you can see in the food, it, it has a lot of integrity. 
Um, so the process starts there. We then have a very large mechanical depackaging. We're removing all of the packaging, the seeds, the metal, the glass, and we're producing a clean liquid slurry that is then amenable to anaerobic digestion. So what is anaerobic digestion? This is a biological process that is taking that clean slurry and it's biologically breaking down the carbon to produce a renewable fuel called biogas and it's largely methane. Uh, it's a one for one replacement for methane. It's the same process that all of our natural gas came from, from over uh, millions of years degrading below the soil, except we're doing it in a very controlled environment. But ironically, this is not the most exciting thing that came out of that project with Kroger. It was the idea for the first time you could stand at our facility and see what 330 grocery stores were throwing away every single day. There's no other way to replicate that experience. You walk onto the floor and you see this material and you immediately start to ask, what is going on? Why are we losing all of this food? What's happening within the supply chain? What's happening within retail? What are consumer behaviors? And and that's the journey that really led us into this path, that this isn't the $5.3 billion food waste recycling industry. This is the $408 billion problem that represents all of the nutrients, the water, the energy, transportation, all of that accretive value to move from farm to shelf that at that last moment, when you have a store associate saying, is this a product that can sell or do I need to pull it and shelve something else? That's what that number represents. It represents in the consumer's home that those strawberries did not get the five-day shelf life that they deserve. They only got three days, and it leads into wasted food. So there's a better way. And there's a really strong urgency, because here in the US, we have about 17 years of landfill capacity that remains. So either we're going to stop producing waste, build new landfills, or find a different way. And that's what I've spent my career doing. Uh, recently, we announced we have a, a billion dollar investment from Enbridge. We have another investment with British Petroleum. We've also raised a quarter billion dollars in equity to build and solve this problem. And what's really fascinating is we now have folks that are not really associated with the food industry coming in and saying, how do we participate? How do we close this circular economy and create that better way? So it's not just renewable energy. And when folks come to us and they say, well, we love you know, what you're doing with RNG and the same thing with Enbridge, we're not an energy business. We are a wasted food business, and that's where our heart and souls remain. In Turlock, California, we're breaking ground. And this time next year, we'll have our, uh, another facility online, which represents the latest and greatest technology that we have. It is a true platform. And the platform in the sense that this isn't just about recycling wasted food, it's about learning about wasted food. How do we prevent? And so an example, California with CVS, we work with about 1,000 CVS locations here on the West Coast. Uh, they had to meet regulations. They came to us and they said, you know, we have to recycle all this food waste coming out of the back end of our stores. You know, we'd love you to take this and turn it into energy. And, and we said, no, we can't do that. We need to learn about what is being wasted and why. And what we found out was, well, there's really actually a lot of healthy, nutritious, packaged foods that have a better use. What they didn't understand is the food banks will take food if it's even six months past its date code. They didn't understand that there was still residual value just because they couldn't sell it didn't mean there wasn't a single mother that was in need of meal-ready foods for her children. And that's what we've been doing. So we built a process that automates and separates food that can't be donated and we recycle about 15%. So for decades, this is food that was going to waste, going to landfill. We've rescued it. We made this a good program for CVS. It's profitable for us. And of course, we're serving a greater need that went underrepresented before. But we didn't stop there. We said, okay, why is this stuff leaving CVS? What, what's happening? This is 14.9 million items per year coming from their stores. Why? So we created a multi-camera image-based system to train neural nets to understand, and finally I was able to use my electrical engineering degree, to understand what's happening. So what are the artifacts of these food products? Is it a crushed box? Is it a date code? Is it mislabeled? And some of the interesting things that we found, we found Tazo teas leaving. And we were asking, why are there so many Tazo teas leaving these stores? And what we found 
the date codes were confusing. So here we have food, perfectly saleable, leaving the shelf because the store associate was misinterpreting the produce by date and the sell by date. So what's the issue? The issue is CVS is losing hundreds of thousands of dollars unnecessarily. We have bad information. So how do we close that loop? And we provided this information to CVS. Uh, updated labeling now, you see less Tazo T's. Clearly that is more acceptable date coding. Uh, but what else? Let's, let's talk about produce. So 85% of what we receive in our bins is produce. Makes sense, it's perishable. Uh, it, one of the greatest selling uh, items within the store, it's why shoppers come to the grocery stores to buy produce. It's something that they want to experience and go through themselves. Uh, but it is a tremendous loss if you look at shrink within, within retail. But there are opportunities and there are challenges. So I was at a grocery store and we were launching, uh, I was just talking to the store manager and I look over and I see somebody shelving iceberg lettuce. And I notice almost methodically, like pulling the lettuce, looking at it, and one out of every six, he was just tossing. And I, and I went over and I said, well, what's going on? And he's like, well, I was, you know, I've been here for four weeks and I was told if I see anything brown on the lettuce to pull it. And I said, okay, but what are you seeing? And he flipped over the lettuce and he showed me the stem. So this should insult everybody in here that's growing iceberg lettuce, going through all that work, you're transporting it, you get it to the end, and you know we have somebody who's not properly trained. And, and this is one of the complexities within retail. And, and it is a really difficult thing. If you've been inside of a grocery store, up to 200 employees at any single location, and they're training, and they have high turnover, and they're worrying about theft, and they're worrying about slips, trips, and falls, and then you have to get food onto the shelf. You have to keep it cool. Um, but it goes deeper. We go into the food supply chain. If we go upstream. The, the idea that we have now created an incredible system, but we've gotten further from our food. Shipping food long distances is, is now the norm. Uh, this idea of a food mile, it's a new concept, but it is important. And, and when, we, when we look at that disconnect, um, consumers get spoiled. And it, maybe it's just my kids that want ripe strawberries in December, um, but that's really the norm and, and it's because of everything you guys have done to create, but that has really created this paradigm that we should have fresh food 365 days a year uh, across all categories, but that's not realistic. Um, so how do we set that up? When we look at that cold supply chain and we've done work with uh, Olivia's and Stop and Shop and others within the industry to understand what's happening from farm to shelf. Where are these challenges? We have more complex supply chains now, which means we need more sophisticated tools to manage these processes. And it's not just technology. Technology is not going to be the complete answer, but it's part of the solution. When we looked at this, we built uh, an IoT platform. We wanted to understand what is happening in that supply chain at all of the touch points? Where are there breakdowns? Where do we see variants happening? Uh, once that material is, is pulled from the farm, it's put into pre-cool, we need to immediately get it to shelf. And so where do we see these hangups? What we learned uh, was actually really surprising to us. There wasn't as much of a problem upstream. What we found where the variance was occurring was within retail. And it was on the shipping side of the dock. So that outbound dock, you know, we started to see instances where distribution centers were running out of space. So they moved over to the warm dock and they started loading out fresh produce, not in 36 degrees, but in 54 degrees. And it would sit there for two hours to get loaded out. It would go onto a trailer and maybe the trailer wasn't as cold as it was, as it was supposed to do. It wasn't pre-cooled. All of this food is degrading at that point. It gets delivered to the store. It sits on the back room of that store for three hours, four hours. Nobody's measuring this, nobody's monitoring it, and we're destroying the value of that food. What we've discovered, it's, it's a function of best managed practices. So we don't need to create new initiatives. What we need to be able to do is to measure, monitor, report, and close that feedback loop so that we can help our retail partners understand how to better run their business. 
And when we think about the value proposition, it's not us trying to push a new product, push a new service. We're really trying to automate uh, what's happening within the store to be first and fresh, to help them preserve what is going to waste. And why do we do all of this? It's, it's all in the name of the consumer. So the consumer at the end of the day is going to go over to that shelf. They're gonna pick up strawberries and what are they going to do? They're going to inspect it. And they're going to say, which one of these packs is going to give me the greatest value for my money? I want not even a single blemish. They don't understand, or maybe they forget, or don't appreciate the idea that somebody handpicked that strawberry, it was put into a package, it was shipped across the country, it was sat in a distribution center, it was moved through, back room, somebody's putting it onto the shelf, and at that very last moment they say, not good enough. And the problem is, the person behind them says, not good enough. And what does that lead to? It leads to us having to then recycle that wasted food. There are things happening within the, within the industry. There are opportunities for markdowns. There are opportunities to take these products, to move them into the back room and produce cut fruit. But how do you measure? How do you then close that data loop so that retailers understand the value that can be created, especially in this labor environment? But with inflation where it is where it is and the cost of food only increasing, it's more important now than ever that we find opportunities to reduce shrink. Within retail, I think one of the most fascinating statistics, if we could eliminate wasted food in retail, we could double their net profit margins. There is no other value proposition within retail uh, that has that type of opportunity. So that's what we're working on. But how do we educate the consumer? How do we bring them into this conversation so they understand? And I think, again, it comes back to data. One of the things we do at our facilities is, is we, we, we do a life cycle analysis. We wanna make sure that the solutions that we're building when we recycle wasted food are the best, most available, best for the environment, and there's a life cycle analysis that we can do. And something that's coming up now is the idea that we can do life cycle analysis on our food which takes into consideration the idea that food grown locally is better, food grown organically is better for the environment, and it's captured within it. We can quantify these things. There is a movement that this is where we need to go to educate the consumer so they can say, what is the sustainability of this strawberry versus that strawberry? What does it mean when I'm not buying that pack of strawberries and it goes to waste or package leafy greens? And that's the approach that, that we've really been been trying to bring to our customers, but it's, it's a consumer conversation. So what I think was amazing about being here is from a retailer perspective, we have growers, uh, it's really all of the business side uh, to make this happen. So I'm excited that, that OPS is bigger now than it ever has been. I really appreciate the opportunity for being here and thank you all for your time.